today we have another treat. And this man over here on my left is a real treasure in the house for those of you who know him. Take care. <laughs> Nate has done, uh, was inspired a, a few years ago uh, by the millstones that uh, used to be a part of the bank, now uh, the entrance to the museum. And that inspired him to do any number of things research-wise. And without further ado, I'm just going to pass it on to Nate. Thank you. Of these 
stones to the tester bank. After finding the stones, the letter writer searched in the available records and found that either Abraham or Gideon Waterhouse had built the mill, and it was probably the oldest uh, grist mill in all of this region of the country, built in the early 1700s. It was that letter that led to the rediscovery of the site of the old grist mill and provided the impetus to embark upon a search to uncover the history of the mill and other people who built and operated it. An exploration of the reputed site of the Waterhouse Grist Mill at the site in the reference to, uh, described in the reference letter was made in June 2012, and the remains of the mill foundation were found a short distance below an existing pond, now known as Waterhouse Pond, which is the uh, reservoir for the Connecticut Water Company and feeds Chester Deep River in Essex. A second exploration was made in December 2012, resulting in finding the traces of the a ditch leading from the pond outlet toward the mill site and a wrought iron artifact from the mill operating machinery. Next slide, please. That was, that's the exploration uh, crew, part of the exploration crew. Uh, that was completely covered with vines and vegetation, and we cleared the area. And you can see the foundation here. It extended all the way back there and down through there and back across here. It was 24 feet in this direction and 22 feet across. That's so the that's Can the foot. Can you say where it was? Can you say where that is? Again? That's on property of the uh, Connecticut Water Company. Uh, it's just below the Water Pond Reservoir, maybe. That's the, that is the artifact that we found. That's again 270 years old. It's a piece of wrought iron. It's a little different. It's hard to see here, right in here. About three quarters of an inch. And that dimple had, had a uh, spindle that set, set in it that supported a ton and a half of stone. Then what I wanted to find out is who were Abraham and, and Gideon Wardhouse, and what did they know about building and operating the mill? <clears throat> Following the finding of the mill remains, a number of genealogical records containing the Wardhouse name were researched, which led to the name of the first Wardhouse to settle in the New England district. In 1635, Jacob Waterhouse, a carpenter, sailed from the town of Chester, England, and landed in New England, the New World. He was part of the exodus of the Puritans, who left England for America to be free to follow their religious principles. He landed in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, Boston area, but after a short stint in Sabre Colony, where he helped build the Sabre Fort. And a few years in Wethersfield, where he started to raise a bit Mary and started to raise a family, he ended up as one of the earliest settlers of New London, which at that time was called Pequa. And he was involved in building the grist mill that was there. Next slide, please. That, that is the uh, grist mill that was built in uh, about 1650 in New London. Uh, it was in uh, for 300 years, it was in operation. It no longer is. It's owned by the Historical Society. It was burned down completely in 1781, I think it was, when Benedict Arnold led a British expedition to New London and burned a good part of New London along with the mill. They rebuilt it. And I think it's been rebuilt a few times. And just recently, within the past five years or so, 
they replaced the water wheel, which is right there. And you can see this long thing here, which is a wooden flume, which contained water from upstream onto the, onto the uh, water wheel. That's, that's located in New London, right underneath the uh, Gold Star Memorial Bridge. <laughs> kind of hard to find. <laughs> you can see part of the bridge. Right? <laughs> okay. There you go. Jacob was the father of seven children, among, among which were Abraham one and Isaac. And I've got to explain. They, they seem to like the name Abraham. <laughs> and went from father to son, so and so on. So I've had to label of Abraham one, Abraham two, Abraham three. <laughs> as it, as it, they appear in the genealogical record of the war house. Both Abraham and Isaac were carpenters, as Jacob was, and had experience, they had experience in building a building in line. Abraham, Isaac stayed in line where he died. Jacob moved to Saybrook, uh, where his uh, father-in-law, uh, who was fairly wealthy, uh, provided some additional funding for him, and he became fairly wealthy. Uh, and he was a carpenter also. Uh, one of his, I mean, one of Abraham, one of his sons, was named Abraham too. <laughs> And as was the custom in those days, he probably uh, apprenticed with his father, and he became a carpenter also. And he became very wealthy. And he owned a lot of land in Saber County, which incidentally was at that time was what is now Old Saber, Old Lime, Lime, Essex, Deep River, Chester, Cunningworth, and Westbrook. That was the Saber County, which shortly thereafter became part of the Connecticut Valley. <clears throat> to these sons, uh, Abraham, Abraham had a, a, quite a family also, but two of the sons were Abraham three <laughs> and Gideon. And both, <clears throat> both were carpenters, and uh, Abraham was also a surveyor. And to those sons, he gave some of the land in what was called the Paddock Quarter of Saybrook, which is we now call Chester. In 1729, Abraham, then 29, and Gideon, just 16, moved up from Saybrook Point to settle in the Paddock Quarter on land given, given to them by the father and established homes at the upper end of what is now known as Goose Hill. They were, reputed, they were reputed to be the builders of the will, located on the west side of Goose Hill Road, at a site alongside a stream and below a body of water, currently known as Waterhouse Pond. I want to stress, though, however, that Waterhouse Brothers did not build the mill by themselves. That could not have been done by just two men. They took the efforts of many men with various skills, carpenters, sawyers, stonemasons, mill dressers, blacksmiths, as well as common laborers to accomplish uh, that were needed to accomplish the actual building of the mill. Construction of the mill required a tremendous amount of labor. I have to stop here for a moment and tell you that as I got into this, I was just completely amazed what these people could do at that time with simple hand tools and just a few of those. What they did then I question whether many of us could do today. Neighbors in the, to, to accomplish the building, neighbors and friends were listened to aid in the actual construction. As many of the parts of the mill building and mill machinery were quite heavy and thus required the efforts of many men to direct the building and, and assemble the machinery. And this was no different than when somebody had to build a farm. Uh, they raised, to build a farm, they had farm raising, and people from miles around came to help. 
And it's, they made the distance pretty simple because they wanted to build the barn too. And they expected reciprocity and they got it. And the women of the community, and it was a small community at that time, also played an important part in the feeding. And clothing ladies actually involved in the building of the mill, as well as undertaking the daily tasks that their husband had left behind in order to come build the mill. So the women had a lot to do with the building of the mill, although indirectly. In colonial times, the grist mill was not that much different from that used by the Grecians and the Romans and the Persians probably before then. Um, if a grist mill wasn't, as you saw on the, on the leader that was up on the screen, the uh, grist mills weren't available. Corn and grains had to be ground by hand in a, in a mortise and pestle type of arrangement. Sometimes they had a, a large one that pitched a horse to a big pole to walk around it and grind it, but it was very slow. And it was, it, it was particularly necessary to be able to grind a lot of the corn and grains because they had a lot of mouths to feed. It was not uncommon to have uh, family uh, children, six, seven, ten or more, Gideon is, a matter of fact, father of 14, oh, 13 of which lived. In colonial times, there was two classifications of grist mill. There was a custom mill and a merchant mill. The custom mill was one for the locality. It served to grind, to grind the, the grist of people living in a fairly small circle, maybe. 10 miles or so uh, in diameter. The miller didn't get paid with cash because cash was very, very <coughs> scarce in those days. Very scarce. And it, it essentially was a part of type of, of uh, society. So he got what was called a toll. He got part of the of the grist that he ground. Uh, in the Connecticut colony, the Assembly of Connecticut in 1653 established the side of that coal <coughs> as one twelfth for Indian corn, other grains, one sixth part. Let me explain. <coughs> corn was unknown in Europe. It originated in the, in the Central American portion of the country by natives thousands of years ago by cultivating it from a grass. The corn is not really a grain as such. It was developed and, uh, by the uh, Central American Indians and then uh, scattered, uh, uh, expanded down south to South America and up north. And it was called maize. The settlers knew it as maize, but it had, uh, Christopher Columbus having named the, the native Indian because he thought he had found the east coast of India when all he had found was the West Indies. Um, but the name stuck, and the settlers, the colonists, soon uh, shortened that to Indians. And so, Corn was known as the engine term, corn or maize. Merchant mills, on the other hand, purchased the, the grist, the, oh, by the way, uh, other grains that were ground in, in uh, Europe and other parts of uh, New England and the Americas. Uh, we couldn't grow it very well here. It was uh, had some sort of a bite. So the natives, had to, the uh, colonists, had to make do with corn and rye. Rye was something that grew, and you still find it growing on the sides of the road. And it's it's a, a, quite a hardy plant. And so they used 
corn and rye to make bread. And it was called Rye and Engine. And that was their daily bread. Uh, and they used corn for a lot of bread stuff and for cereal matter also. So if you had a, a large family, you sure did appreciate having the grist mill. And the grist mill was one of the first things that the settlers wanted to have. There's two main things, that, three main things they needed. One was a grist mill, another was a sawmill, and the third was a blacksmith. Those three things were necessary for driving the And some of the, the few iron parts of the mill, most of the mill was mostly wood, but a few iron parts were made by a blacksmith. Uh, in some cases, they were imported from uh, England. In a lot of cases, they were made right here in the United States. And let me digress for a minute, but we had an iron forge here in Chester that made pig iron, wrought iron, and all sorts of iron goods. But it came much later after the people had come and gone. Merchant mills, I started to say, merchant the wisdom of farmers and process the, the, uh, uh, the corn mill and flowers. There are a great many custom mills all throughout New England and all throughout the colony. And as a matter of fact, all throughout the United States as the, as the country expanded. Uh, custom mills, which probably, <coughs> there were just a few of them. Uh, an example was one owned by George Washington that sold his, his product from the mill far and wide, including throughout the West Indies. <coughs> a good mill site, which was called a mill seat, needed to have a stream with an adequate supply of water and with sufficient fall as the vertical drop between the source of the water and where the mill was located. You need to have a dam and a mill pond to abound the water for dry periods and to regulate flow. To operate a water powered mill such as the Waterhouse Grist Mill, water was delivered from a pond. Could we go to the next slide? It was delivered from a pond via an open channel, which we call a raceway to a point where it could be picked up by a wooden contrivance called the foam. It was a, just a, a new shape of the channel. The water flowed through the mill. was controlled by a gate at the, at the uh, entrance to the foam and another gate. Right here, that would control the flow onto the water wheel. So they could raise and lower that gate and then control the amount of water. And this controlled the speed of the, of the water wheel and also the power delivered to the water wheel. The water wheel of the water hits mill <coughs> was the type where water was delivered to the top of the water wheel and exited at the bottom. And the velocity of the water hitting each or the water wheel contained a series of buckets all around it. And as you fill the bucket, the water would start to uh, move, and the next bucket would be filled. And the next would go take down and spill out at the bottom to what was called a tail race. Millstones were the most vital components of the mill as they accomplished the actual grinding of the grist. There were many. Next slide. Oh, there's another slide indicating how the water wheel would operate. Water flowed from the foam onto the wheel. And then. 
So if the water wheel really consisted of what you can imagine as two wagon wheels fixed to the same shaft and with buckets spanning between them, a whole series of buckets all the way around the perimeter of the wheel. Each wheel had a, a series of spokes that were attached to the rim of the water wheel and mortised into the shaft that ran through both water wheels into the mill building. Now that, you can see there's only a few of these rounds, and there are 
great many cogs and cogs. In the model over here, I have 96 cogs and 14 rounds in the lantern. That means that the, when the water wheel turned at 10 revolutions a minute, which is quite slow, if you think about it, the, the water wheel would maybe turn at this speed, and the uh, lantern would turn at seven, seven times that speed. So that it went from 10 revolutions per minute of the water wheel to 70 revolutions of the spindle. And that's what gave the circular motion and the speed to the millstones. I said it was nicely, mostly made of wood and it's right. But associated with this, with this machinery were a few small parts fabricated from iron called mill irons. These included the gudgeons, the iron bands that I showed you, the fittings that supported the bottom of the spindle, and the fittings at the upper end of the spindle. And also a piece, a couple of pieces that I'll discuss that was important, uh, millstone. And then there were two millstones at uh, the Waterhouse uh, Risk Mill. Many custom mills had two sets of stones. They were called runners of stone. One runner of stone was for milling corn and rye, and the other was for milling wheat, oats, and barley, which they didn't do here because they couldn't really grow it in, in the Sabre County. They grew it up north of uh, Durham, if I recall, had a good wheat field, but then it didn't work down here. Uh, Many of you are from this area. You've heard of Cornfield Point. Well, that's where the colony, the Sabre Colony, grew their corn. And it was just uh, indicative of what, how important it was that they would march out there to get the corn and fend off the Indians and bring it back to, the, to a, a grist mill that was built at Sabre Colony, and it was a windmill. That's because there was a fair amount of wind at the shore. So they used wind instead of water for power. The spindle. Next slide, please. Indication of what cog it looks like. These cogs, incidentally, were made of apple wood, uh, which were apple was strong but brittle, and there was a reason for that because of something caught somewhere in the gearing, or a poor apprentice got his hand in it, and then it didn't happen. The, the cog would snap off, and the mill would stop. And that saved uh, a lot of uh, collateral da damage. <laughs> the spindle passed through a bushing in the, uh, let's have the next slide, please. Well, there's a, uh, a sketch of the, of the mill machinery. There's a, the, the shaft, the guzzins at each end, the water wheel. There's the wooden pool up there that delivered the water. This is the cog wheel. It had, this is just representative of the cogs. that hit the rounds of the lantern pinion and turned it. The, the, uh, then they'll pass up through a wooden bushing, and it was fitted at the top uh, with iron pieces. <coughs> and the bed stone, there was two stones, one called a bed stone, or a, and that, those years, a <coughs> nether stone. And the top stone was called a runner stone, and it was the one that turned. And it was suspended very ingeniously by what was called a balance rind, which was a, a four-fingered piece of iron with a dimple in the bottom of it. And there was an iron 
fitting fashion to the uh so called the base head. And it had a uh, half rounded end of it and it fitted into that balance line. And that was used to raise and lower the millstone, which incidentally moved generally uh, less than an eighth of an inch and sometimes between the two stones. And when they really wanted to grind fine at the outside edge of the stone, it was paper thin space between the two stones. <coughs> and what is remarkable is that if, if you can picture each, that runner stone weighing a ton and a half and spinning at 70 mil revolution per minute, there was a lot of energy there. Tremendous amount of energy. There was a centrifugal force going on. <coughs> And if that thing was out of balance, and one stone hit the other, you could literally tear the bottom, tear the middle part. And there were instances where the stone flew off the balance line, went through the side of the building, and in more than one instance, took the miller with it. Mm -hmm. Miller was not a, uh, an easy job, and was somewhat of a dangerous job, and a dusty job. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Now the balance line, as I told you, was used to balance the stone, and below it was a, what was called the driver next to it. Slide, please. Okay. There are the stones. There's the balance line right there. You can see the fingers, and at the end of the fingers, there were projections that fit into notches in the stone and the burn stone. And that's how they held the stone up. And then we had a, a driver, again, fixed to the base head, and that would fit in a couple of other slots in the stone, and that's what rolled the stone around. But it had nothing to do with supporting the stone. The, the uh, balance line held the stone, the driver rolled around. Now, it's amazing to me how they were able to balance those stones. But balance them they did. And if you remember out on the outside of the stone, on the perimeter of the stones, they were paper thin distance apart. And yet they balanced these stones. Nate, could you remind us what the weight of a stone oh, was yes. like each, ours? Oh, yeah, one of those stones, not these stones, these were pictures I took, or were taken at the Plymouth Mist Mill in Plymouth Mass. But our stones that we have down at the uh, museum were about a ton and a half of these. And they were made locally, probably by either the Waterhouse boys and men, or what they called a, a stone dresser. And they were cut out of local rock. We had a uh, geologist that Skip uh, managed to find that identified it as local granite. And if you imagine cutting those things out of solid stone and trimming them and, and getting them into Pretty good balance. And then they, they work uh, and they had ways of balancing by drilling into them and pouring lead in there uh, or, or adding a piece of iron here and there. And they had to do it statically while the, the millstone was sitting there, getting it perfectly uh, horizontal. And then they had to balance, balance again when it was rotating. They had to put weights along the rim to get it to rotate perfectly horizontal. And um, back to the previous slide, was it if you can? <coughs> the bottom the bottom of the spindle sat in the tram pot. And on the mill that's over here is a tram pot that we found at the mill. It's a piece of wrought iron, weighs about six and a half pounds. 
and it sat on a piece of, on a timber, what was called a bridge tree, and they would move the, the, that fan pot around until the spindle was perfectly vertical after it was in the uh, balance rain. Did that bear all the weight of the stone? Oh, yes. It was only about the, uh, the point that sat in the fan pot. It was only about three quarters of an inch in diameter. But remember, the stone was 3,000 pounds, and iron can take uh, oh, a uh, direct stress of something like 15 to 20,000 pounds per square inch. So it uh, sounds like uh, I believe it's very, very simple. Incidentally, these mills were not built with plans. They didn't have plans in those days. Uh, if you hired a millwright, he had a bunch of models. And if you wanted to build a mill, you would go to the millwright and ask him to, to build you a mill and say, well, which kind do you want? But before I can tell you that, I've got to go see where the mill is going to be. So I can see how much water is going to be coming down and what kind of a fall I had to do. And uh, would, in this particular case, yet they consulted a little right, which I don't believe they did. Uh, he would have said, you need an overshot water wheel. And, and uh, the, uh, there were no plans, no, it was before the age of photography. And unfortunately, there was nobody, there was nobody there that made a paint of the mill. That was the only way they had of, of uh, recording what the mill was like. Interesting enough, downstream, I guess about a half mile downstream, on the same brook, which is called Waterhouse Brook, there was a tannery and a uh, bark mill. Um, in the early 1800s, and that that ran with the same water, but there was a painting of that, and I was lucky enough to be given a, a photograph of the painting, um, and it's amazing uh, how these things were built. What established the diameter of the wheel, man? It was partly how much power you had available and partly how much you wanted to produce. The bigger the wheel, the more corn you could grind on it. And uh, I don't know how they settled on five, but these were five feet in diameter. I don't know how they settled on that, but that was a common size they ran anywhere from two feet to six feet in diameter. The fan pot again, rested on a bridge tree. They had a genius method of uh, Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Could we have the next slide? Next slide. Next slide. Okay. This, this is an age-old principle of the lever and the fan. It went back to recent times. And before that, I'm sure. The fan pot was down here. It's a point. The spindle which turned the upper millstone. It rested on this bridge tree, which in turn rested on what was called a brayer. <coughs> in turn it was pinned to what they call a lightning tree. It brought it up to the next floor. And that was connected to the lightning staff. And they these things were so proportionate that this time and a half stone could easily be moved up and down by just reaching up and pulling on that lever. And uh, we worked out some uh, 
dimensions and found out that uh, it was very easy to reduce that weight to 20 pounds at the lever. And they held that lever in position by a strap. It was a leather strap that was attached to some portion of the middle structure and wrapped around a couple of times at the end of the staff. Uh, and there was a bottle weight that weighed four or five pounds out of wood that held that tension on that strap. And if the miller wanted to just the spacing, he would give the bottle a little tap. Tap it again, he'd sniff of what was coming out of the stones and wrist, the, the, the meal. And if it was too coarse, he would give it another tap, he would lower it down a little more. Very, very simple, very ingenious. How did they lubricate the bearing surfaces? With towel. With towel? Yeah. Uh -huh. And they uh, put over here and grease. Uh, you, that was the job of the apprentice. Uh, among many of his job. He had all the dirty work. And he would, uh, in, in this model, you'll see two ladders coming up, one on this side of the, of the uh, where the stones are, one on the other. You have to climb the ladder and put towel in the, in the uh, pan pot and also uh, coat the rounds of the pendant and the cogs of the cog wheel with grease. And that's where the danger came in, because he had to do that water with rubber. And he got some coating caught in there. He could easily get pulled into the mechanism. That was the reason I talked about before, about uh, using the apple wood and the cog, so if something like that happened, the stress would snap the cog and stop it. Thank you. 
this one that we have here, but it's a good illustration. They had a crane, a wooden crane, with an iron rod that went down to it. We had two uh, bales. And the bales at the bottom of them had two rods that came out that fit into the holes in the uh, millstone. And so they would put the lower down, put the connect the bale to the stone, crank it up, swing it around, flip the stone over, and lay it down so that it could be redressed. And the furrows in the land could be sharp. After which they would put it back in place. The stones had a cover over them called a tongue, T U N. And that cover would be the outside of the of the stone, but you can see here this area was open, there's the opening in the top. What was very important that air get into the grinding operation. <coughs> One of the functions of the furrows was to distribute the air throughout so that you didn't obey the meal. If you did, it would become rancid and no good. Writings were moving around on the stone. They kept spiraling out in a spiral fashion until they hit the edge of the, of the stone and it dropped in between the stone and the tusks. Fairly narrow ring around the stone. The centrifugal force of the air and the stones moved the, the uh, ground you know, around to what was called a spout. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> there's a, a, an example. There's the ground meal. There's the spout, which went down into the <coughs> container on the lower floor, called the meal box. And incidentally, I told you the meal, that the miller got a toll, and he would take that out of the meal box. But what else did he get? When he took the tongue off, he had all of that left too. That was a bonus. <laughs> uh, the uh, grain that went down to the, the meal that went down to the uh, here was collected in the mailbox and sent either as it came down through or afterwards by the door or sometimes the farmer just took it home and sent it himself. In later years they came up with a circular contraction, contraction that looked like a, uh, a tube uh, covered with a few slats and cloth wound around it of various size mesh and the the uh, zip was at an angle and as it as it spun around and they dropped the, the meal into it uh, they had the uh, finer material first then a little coarser and a little coarser so they could segregate the meal into various grades and what remained in that at the end of that, spilled out into a container that was used to feed the, the, the livestock. What kind of rotational speeds did you see in stones of that size? About 70 to 100 revolutions per minute. A mill of the, of the size that they had up there, I believe, somewhere around 70 revolutions per minute. And did they have much heat build up in these, and how did they dissipate? Well, they did. <laughs> the point of the grooves is the stone, and, and uh, there's a hole in the middle of the stone, the eye, was such that air could be drawn down through to keep it cool, to keep the meal cool. If for some reason 
here was black, but too much of the grist that was dropped into the eye of the snow, or they were too tight to the snow to snow, and they didn't get enough uh, air there. It was spoiled the meal. And we had to slow this fire for the lifetime. They do for rolling control, they have cats or something? I would imagine rolling would be all over the place. Oh, yes. Oh, that's for sure. The miller always had a cat, or maybe more than one cat. Uh, they had insects and rodents and, and dust all over cobwebs. It was not a very significant place. <laughs>
crystals of this period. And you will see some of them that show the core being deposited into the eye of stone. And it was just a dribble. It just a little trickle in. If you, if you toss it too much, you get a lot of it, and that would jam the stone and, and heat up the stone. Mm -hmm. Very, very ingenious. They also had, you see this thing here, that was called a damsel. The damsel, uh, the bottom row of the fingers on the balance line and the valve. And the top of the damsel had a projection on it that struck against the side of the shoe and would shake the shoe. So that would help the corn kernels to move down the shoe into the eye of the stone. They say it was called a damsel because it clattered a lot. <laughs> and it reminded them of the chattering of the damsels. And I apologize if I uh, insulted. I don't mean to be sexist. I want to say in those, those days, there was a lot of sexism. The, 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 there were parts of the stone who called the bosom, the skirt. Uh, there were parts of the iron that I'm not even going to repeat <laughs> The mill was constructed at a very heavy temperature. To give you an idea, that for a mill the size of the, uh, the White House mill, that shaft was probably two foot of diameter and 20 foot long. When that was cut down green, it weighed two tons. And after it had been seasoned, it weighed a ton and a half. Now these people didn't have cream, didn't have any chemical facilities at all they had to force those things in there by themselves. Now what they did is they would peel the bark off the shaft, off the tree, after spending a lot of time in the forest hunting for something that was a tree, a white oak tree that was very straight. They would cut it down with a two-man saw and some axes, all by hand. Then they would strip the bark off of it with a draw knife. And then they would season it. It had to be seasoned because if white oak wasn't seasoned, it had to be what? Built a mill out of unseasoned wood and it would stop it move around because as it shrank, the dimensions would change. So they had to season the wood first. And to season the rod like that probably took a couple of years or more. <coughs> and so when the, uh, the information we had on the, on the Ford House Brothers that they came up to uh, Paddock on quarter in 19, pardon me, 1729, and built the mill. Well, it didn't happen in 1729, as far as I can understand it. They first had to come up into a wilderness and build some sort of shelter for themselves and their families. That took a while to cut wood and season that. Build this, build the uh, shelter, which was linked to a person and a, a house. And then they had to cut all the wood for the mill. Now, we had to, at that point, there wasn't a grist mill. There wasn't a small mill anywhere near. So they had to cut these, these trees down by hand and then work at them with hand tools and to cut, I mean, to cut a, uh, a uh, fabricate the shaft. They would have first to chew it into a, a square, and they would turn it up in one corner of the square, and they would trim it again until they got it to an octagonal shape. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. An awful lot of work. I marvel at what they did. I, to this day, I have a tremendous admiration for these people. Not only did they do this, they were 
farmers. Everybody was a farmer. Everybody was perhaps a minister. So they had to work on a farm. They had to do all this work. And protect themselves and hunt. Pull stumps. They didn't, didn't pull so many stumps. Uh, clear their fields of stones. And you know, I've heard say that the two best crops in Connecticut are uh, rock and stones. Was <laughs> <laughs> And to give you an idea of the amount of stone in the soil, if you walk out in the forest around here today, along the roads, you'll see stone walls. Those stone walls were built from the stones that they removed from the fields. And that took a lot of work. So they had all that to do, the brothers, and still build the mill. How many of you think you can do that today? <laughs> there are some people that still do it. There are people up in Alaska that still cut down trees and fabricate their, their uh, timber and build them homes. But few and far between. Now,
spring and during the fall, during the harvest times. Um, not in the winter time, but still, they wanted it on the south side <coughs> to keep the weight of the ice off the water wheel. And yet, all during the winter, they would have the friends and the hill climb up on that water wheel. It was steady thick and chip off ice to keep the ice from destroying the water wheel. operated by Gideon Waterhouse, who was also a farmer, and had died by his son John, who moved into Gideon's house and for 30 years operated the mill until 1810 when he sold it. There are some indications that another one of Gideon's sons, Elijah Waterhouse, may have worked for a short time after that. But somewhere in the early 1800s, after 1810, the mill ceased operation. I tried finding a looking for a tax record that would indicate whether the mill was still in operation. But unfortunately, they had been destroyed or lost. And the earliest ones I could find was 1836. But at that time, there was no mention of the Gristmill, of the Waterhouse Gristmill. There were other Gristmills in town by then. But it was Certainly uh, not available in uh, Abraham died at the age of 65. Um, Gideon lived, I think, until he was 74. I believe they're still buried in They're buried rather in the old cemetery right here in the corner. Elijah lived to be 98. His house still stands at 60. Still still rolling. And he Interesting enough, uh, in uh, the letter that I talked to you about the concern about the Jefferson's, uh, he talked about the old man, the miller, 98 years old, and he thought it was either Gideon or Abraham, but it was neither. They had died much earlier. So he was talking about Elijah, so it was very possible, on oh, that report, that Elijah did operate the mill, because he had a one quarter interest. When John sold the mill, he sold three quarters of the mill. In those days, the potters divided, and their wills divided things up among all their children. And when uh, 
John Mannes did a uh, assembly three quarters of ownership of the mill. One quarter was still held by Elijah. And when he sold the mill, uh, in his deed, he uh, made sure that Elijah would have access to the mill over the land that he sold. Mm -hmm. So, in conclusion, the first mill that provided the corn mill in life for general brothers, several generations of Chester citizens, is no longer nothing but a memory of bygone days of long ago when the early colonial settlers eked out a living out of this wilderness that was here from their farms and woodlands. I want to close by reading a, an excerpt from a poem, The Brookside, by Richard Martin Mills, which contained words which were appropriate. I wandered by the brookside. I wandered by the mill. I could not hear the book flow. The noisy mill was still. And that sort of speaks of what happened eventually. It can be inferred that this early mill was very significant and that it helped to demonstrate the work of water power that was available in several streams that crossed through Chester. And it helped lay the foundation for a prosperous town and as many mills and industries that were developed to take advantage of such power. And could we have that list now? This is a, a list of industries that developed along most of them developed along the stream from Chester. Paddock on Brook and Great Brook. And, and the family that also was located on the House Brook. Next slide.
Right back here. We have some right back here. Oh, yeah. uh, they're only they're fifteen dollars, but today everyone's a member, so you get the member credit. Twelve dollars. And there's masses of food and drink left, so please yeah. don't leave without me. So much wanted to see that. Thanks again, thank you. Thanks for yeah. Yeah. Just if you haven't been to the mill, again, we're open Thanksgiving. You can sit, you can stand on these three thousand pound millstones. Thank you. 